So hello and welcome along to another edition of Isolation Interviews for Hospital Radio Reading and for my YouTube channel. And I am super excited to be joined by the very talented Reverend Kate Botley. It is an honour and a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. Uh, uh, I'm a little bit scared of the phrase YouTube because that means that this is visual. Um, <laughs> and as you can see, I am not at my best groomed this morning, but that's OK. I think I think it's good to see people in the public eye looking less than perfect every now and again. Well, I was going to say, I never look perfect. So so that's that's, you know, that's always the way I do things. Um, but and obviously, I, I've got this huge micro microphone in front of my face. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see. And if you're listening, let me describe it to you. I've got the big, world's biggest microphone in front of my face because that's what happened in lockdown. That's what happened when we were in isolation. We all got these bits of kit delivered to our houses and just sort of cobbled together these studios. Well, my husband um, trained as a sound engineer originally, so he finally felt vindicated because all the boxes of wire that I've been trying to get him to throw out for the last 25 years of our marriage, he finally went, ooh, I know what we could do. And so he set me up with all these like posh bits of kit. Um, and lots of people who interview me on radio go, oh, I like your setup. Look, look at the size of your microphone. There's a whole lot of microphone comparisons going on. I mean, do you enjoy working from home and doing all this, or do you prefer getting out and going to a studio? I prefer getting out. I'm useless at working from home because I am easily distracted. So um, I intend to get up early and, get, and do that thing that clever people do, where they get out of bed and they get dressed like as if they're going out of the house for work, and then they sit in the same spot. I don't do that. I will have the telly on. I'll be baking bread. I'll be trying to make an do an interview at the same time. Um, so it doesn't really work for me. But the blessing for me in isolation was because I do um, radio and telly, we were considered part of the essential sort of criteria sort of thing. Um, and uh, we were allowed to go out and about. And I drove up to Salford for my Radio 2 show every Saturday night all the way through. And there was just me, uh, food delivery trucks and ambulances on the M62. And we all just waved to each other as we went past. And I got stopped by the police twice, which was very exciting. Um, but I found that a dog collar and a BBC lanyard can get you most places, even places you really shouldn't be. <laughs> Now, I mean, we must talk about, obviously, the, the hot weather recently. How have you been coping with this hot, cold, hot, cold? Now it's cold, it was hot. How are you coping with it all? Because I know you do a lot, of, a lot of outdoor swimming. Yeah, well, I'm a ginger, um, and uh, so I do not thrive in hot weather at all. I go um, a sort of gorgeous colour of uh, lobster, I would describe it. Um, so I have a barrel in my back garden that's filled continually with cold water that I get in. Um, but even the water's been too warm. Anything above, well, I like it below 10 degrees in the water and anything above 16 is just too hot for me. So our lake at the moment is 24 degrees, which there's no adrenaline in getting in warm water like that for me. So yeah, lots of water, lots of ice drinks, lots of sitting in the shed, lots of getting up really early, which is not my bag at all, getting up at sort of 6 a.m., um, doing some stuff and then going to sleep at two in the afternoon. That's what we've been doing. One of the things I've invested well, well, winter. <laughs> one of the things I well, I say I invested in. I, I uh, came across it recently. Is one of these um, ice cooler things that you put in your pillow. My word, it makes All a difference right. at night. Yeah, it literally, you end up with a nice cold head at night. I thoroughly recommend it. That, that sounds great. Um, I've been. Uh, me and my husband argue about this. It's, we don't argue about many things in our marriage, but one of the things we argue about is windows open and doors open. He can. He has to sleep in a cave, so he has to have the curtains shut, the windows shut the door shut, um, completely black, completely silent. And I like the window wide open, the door wide open, um, no sheets on, nothing on, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so we've been sleeping separately for the last, what, however long this heat thing's been going on. So it, it's quite nice. It's been quite nice now the cooler temperatures are here to go, oh, you, I remember <laughs> you. I quite like you. <laughs> I mean, obviously, with going back to the the cold water swimming. I mean, what, what's because I mean, I've never done it. it. It looks like something that's amazing. I should do it. But what 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 is it you get from that? What what is that feeling like of jumping in the cold water? Well, first things first, you must never jump in, oh. um, because obviously, cold water shock is a real thing, and that's what we're seeing with um, these tragedies over the summer. It happens every year, as you know, and it, invariably, I'm afraid, it is boys usually that die, and usually boys that are in their teenage years because they jump in. And it may be a roasting hot day, but the water is still cold if you're not used to it. And so that <gasps> breath that you do when you enter something cold, if you do that on top of the water, that's fine. But if you do that when you're under it, 
that's the end of that. So um, it, jumping in is not a thing. And obviously, you might need to make sure you not have a drink, and you need to make sure you're swimming somewhere that you know quite well. I always recommend people start off, um, not, you know, you don't don't just go for a walk and go, oh, there's a waterfall, I'll get in that. Um, start with a club, start with, or text, go with somebody who knows what they're doing. It's really popular now. So there's loads of guides and things that will will take you out. Um, what I get from it, that was your question. Um, so I first started to swim in, I've always swum outside, I've always gone for a swim in the sea on holiday and I've always gone for a swim in rivers and stuff when we've been walking and things. But I started properly about four and a half years ago and it was winter and the water was two degrees and I went with a friend of mine called Johnny who's a regular outdoor swimmer and... Um, it's all about extreme sports are often about attacking it. So if you're going to bungee jump or rah, let's do this rah, testosterone, rah, attack it. Um, it's like the exact opposite. You have to not fight it. So you get in the water and you feel that it's really, really flipping cold. Um, and you allow yourself to feel how cold it is and how frightening that is. And then you slow your breathing right down and you slow your heart rate right down and you feel the cold and you get in really slowly. Um, and for me, that practice of breathing and controlling my anxiety and my adrenaline um, in the job I do is really important because I do some I do some scary stuff. I mean, relatively, it's not scary. I'm not putting people on ventilators. I'm not saving lives. But it, you know, standing in front of massive audiences, speaking to lots of people, being on live telly is quite a nerve wracking thing. I find it might not be for others. And so I need those skills to kind of calm me down, as well as doing, you know, funerals and stuff like that, which can pe people might find scary. Um, it's a really good practice to kind of slow your heart rate down. Also, it makes me feel like Superwoman when someone walks past <laughs> swimming in ice water and they go, are you going to swim in that? And I go, yes, and I feel really strong. And I don't feel like that doing sport normally. I wasn't built for sport. I was never picked first at PE. That wasn't happening. <laughs> Now, I mean, going back to, to when you were a child, do you remember kind of where, you know, because obviously your career has been amazing. You've done so many different things. But do you remember where you wanted to be as a child, what you wanted to do? Yeah. So initially I wanted to, um, I wanted to be uh, um, an airline stewardess. That was one of the things that was around just because I'd been on holiday on a plane and they seemed really glamorous. So I thought I might want to be one of them. Then I wanted to be a newsreader. And I remember someone telling me that I would never make a newsreader because of my accent. Then uh, for a while, I wanted to be an actor. That was always around. That was always floating about. I went to theatre school, went to um, youth theatre when I was a kid. I was 11, so I quite like that. But teacher was the general standback, and that's what I did. Left uni, uh, went to uni, did a four-year degree in education and theology, went off to be an RE teacher, really rough comprehensives in Sheffield. Um, but I've always been a desperate show off. And I mean, obviously, you know, you eventually um, took the call and, and became a reverend. I mean, how did that come about? Because, I mean, um, when I spoke, to, I had the pleasure of interviewing the reverend Richard Coles. And obviously for him, it was music, but then he went into religion. So it was kind of a sort of a later thing for him. Yeah. But for you, where did it come into? How did it come into your life? Well, I was, wasn't brought up in a family of faith. We, we were christened as babies and, you know, but we didn't, and we might say grace at Christmas, but we didn't, we never, ever, ever went to church, not even on high days and holidays. Um, but, you know, we weren't anti-religion, but we just wasn't something we did. And um, I had a group of friends at school who went to church. They invited me along, so off I went. And that's where I, I saw this vicar's son that I really liked the look of. I really fancied him. So that kept me going because I thought I might get a snog. I did get a snog, by the way. We that we've been married for twenty odd years. Uh, that was the vicar's son. So um, yeah, and then what happened was um, we carried on going to church. I had I had a sort of classic kind of. Someone asked me. It was a conversion experience, really. Somebody said to me, "Do you believe in God or not? You do you believe in God or not?" And I just went, "Yeah, I do." And in that moment, it was like a moment of realization that actually I'd gone from being someone who went along to church as a sort of club or a. Uh, you know, to be there with my friends, um, to actually a moment of going, yeah, this is this is for me, this is my faith. So then I got confirmed, all that kind of thing. Went off to teaching, and then after the birth of, actually, it was a, it was while I was pregnant with Arthur, our second child. So around two thousand and three, um, what happens is you do not go see your careers advisor and go, I want to be a vicar. If anybody ever tells you that they want to be a priest, they probably shouldn't be one. It's like being prime minister or an MP. You pro if you don't want to do it, you you're not the right person. Um, and so it, what 
happens is you are called by the people around you. So enough people at church, the church we were at, started coming up to me and going, you're really good at the front. You're really good at this. Have you thought about ordination? You're really good at this. Or I think, I think you might be being called. And enough people say it to you that you think, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to take it seriously. So you start going off to the kind of, um, the, what we call the discernment process. You go see people who are cleverer than you who go, hmm, let me ask you a few questions and see where this leads. And I, I said at the beginning of the process, I'd see how far it went. And as soon as the door shut, that would be it. Um, and lo and behold, after my first kind of conversation about ordination, a year later, I was off at theological school, a vicar, vicar factory, and being turned, into a, being turned into a priest. What was that like as an experience? Because I, I imagine if you, if you, if it kind of, you weren't necessarily originally thinking that would be the way you go. When, I mean, when you suddenly go that down that road and, and, and sort of start the process, I mean, how was it for you? Did you, you know, was it a, a fun experience or, or were you quite nervous? a massive mixed bag i mean you're changing you're uprooting your entire life so i'd only ever lived away from home i'd always lived in sheffield i'd only li i'd only lived in leeds for four years which is like less than an hour away from sheffield um my mum was very very ill at the time she was in intensive care and not expected to survive she did um but it was i, I uprooted Graham had to stop working Graham finished his job that he was doing we uprooted the children from their schools we moved to a brand new city we, I st we had no, knew nobody there. Um, it was, it, I imagine that it was a system that was invented years and years ago when most clergy went to boarding schools in their youth. And it was a lot of straight white men that didn't, a single straight white men that didn't have the kind of responsibilities that a, a woman in her mid thirties might have. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's, the system's not necessarily built with the idea of, you know, modern, kind of families and, and relationships in mind. Um, it was, yeah, it was trans It was what you expect. It was two years that were utterly transformative. Um, it had, I didn't fit, but I never do. Um, there were a lot of very nice people. Um, they, a lot of them went to very nice schools and um, their, ex their educations have been more expensive than mine. Um, it, it's, it, it I was a foreigner in a foreign land. There weren't very many working class accents there. Let's put it that way. They were more Coles than Botley. Let's say <laughs> that. <laughs> I mean, I hope you don't mind me asking this, but I mean, you know, as a woman, did you find it harder to, to, to you know, kind of get people to accept you or, or were people really accepting and really like welcoming? Yeah, I mean, you have to pick, you have to pick your battles and you have to pick your churches, really. So generally, no. I think people still think that being a female priest is an unusual thing because we still remember Dibley. Um, you you probably only watched it second hand, being born in 1993. Um, but, um, you know... We've had women priests for as long, nearly as long as you've been alive, Matthew. So it's not it, it's not a new thing. It's quite old now. It was the 90s. Um, and a lot of bad things happened in the 90s, but a lot of good things happened as well. Acid House and the ordination of women, chiefly being the two. Um, uh, and the emergence of British hip hop. Um, anyway, uh, it, it's... Um, yeah, you still have it. You still get it every now and again. You know, you'll still be in a cathedral where you're processing in and a colleague won't stand next to you because you're a woman. You know, you still get people who won't take communion from you because you're a woman. And you still occasionally get people who go, oh, we don't want you doing granny's funeral because you're a woman. And often, it, and, and they go, it's not personal. Well, it kind of is. Um, you just be really gracious. What I always do in those circumstances, if the phone call comes that there's been a, there needs to be a funeral and they don't want you, sort of thing but they need to use the church that you look after so can they have your permission i uh, i tend to go around to the family's house and have a cup of tea with them and i have to be honest nine times out of ten after that cup of tea they go oh actually you're all right aren't they because that's the thing is when it's not when it's something abstract you can be against it but when it's somebody sat down in your house having a cup of tea it's very difficult to be angry with that person or to be against that person we see that all the time don't we not just with misogyny and sexism but with homophobia with racism when it's something abstract when it's people you've never met it's very easy to say i i don't agree with that i am against that but once you've sat down and had a cup of tea with somebody or a or a sticky bun or whatever you know you kind of go oh you're all right. I used to have it all the time when I was a teacher. I taught in a main white working class school and we had one Asian pupil. And I would get kids spouting this racism about how they didn't like Asian people. But then in the next sentence, they go, but you're all right, Wasif. And it's like, you know, 
you just have to remember everybody's OSC for you just have to remember everybody you know we have to personalize this stuff and conversation dialogue is always the way forward getting angry about stuff and throwing bricks really doesn't solve anything but talking to somebody usually does I couldn't have put it better myself absolutely you know that's uh, perfect um now obviously you know Gogglebox came along was that was that did that come out of the blue how did that come about um, so I went, I was in a parish church that was absolutely gorgeous and glorious, a huge barn of a building, gothic, priory, stunning architecturally. And they were doing four weddings a year and they were skinned. Frankly, they were skinned. Now I love weddings because everybody's happy at a wedding. Uh, the bride and groom obviously should be happy. The congregation should be happy. I'm happy because I get to stand at the front and make two people's, you know, day. I get to be part of the best day of their lives. I get to tell them God loves them. So tick, 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 tick. And also people pay for weddings. Now, church weddings are actually, uh, the wedding ceremony itself is one of the cheapest aspects of the wedding. It costs less than the dress usually. It's about, I don't know the current figures, but it's, it's less than 400 quid to get married in church. Um, and so that's probably less than you're spending on your frock. Certainly less than you're spending on your flowers, I should imagine. Um, so my treasurer's happy because it keeps the, you know, and everyone's in a good mood. So weddings are great. So I said to my treasurer and my congregation, how would it be, because I love doing weddings, if we try and get these numbers up a little bit? Uh, and the treasurer went, that sounds like a great idea to me. <laughs> so I, I, I agreed with him. Um, I knew there would be a little bit more work for the congregation, but they could see that their building was going to close if we didn't do something. Um, and this wasn't only going to help with revenue. And I mean, that's quite a cynical point of view, because if brides and grooms come and get married, usually what happens is a few years later, they come back for a christening. And before long, we are part of their lives. This church is part of their lives then. And they can't imagine ever going there. And then they come back at Christmas for a carol service. And then they come back at Easter for the Easter egg hunt. And then they come back. And before long, before they actually know it, they're part of the church family. And we can see our future, right, our present and our future right there. Also, rural congregations, average age of about 75. You know, so we, we love seeing people, because invariably people are getting married in their in late th uh, 30s or late 20s. So it's lovely to see younger people in church. So I upped weddings and I worked really hard and I went to wedding, um, you know, these kind of like uh, sales things where the wedding, what are they call wedding fairs. I went to wedding fairs with my dog collar on and a leaflet and went, hello, come and get married at my church. Um, uh, so I, we went from sort of six weddings a year to 38 weddings a year, which is a lot of work, but it's doable. You know, we were doing two or three weddings a day sometimes. Gary and Tracy came to see me. They wanted to get married. And I said yes. Uh, and I was big on personalisation. I am big on personalisation. If you want it, I will do it within the realms of legality and propriety. And I will push both of those. Uh, they wanted to do a flash mob at their wedding. They wanted to do one of these things where one person starts dancing and the next person starts dancing and the other starts dancing. Um, so that's what we did. And it went viral on YouTube with 10 million hits. And the producer of Gogglebox saw it. And... That's what happened. And, that, and the rest, as they say, Matthew, is history. Did you ever imagine that that it would lead on to something like Gogglebox? Was that some? Was that even in in your sort of thought process of something you wanted to do? You know, what was it like? I presumed that the local press would be interested. I because you know. Vickers is still a bit of a novelty and we're still, you know, the the public perception of us is that we're boring. Actually, I always ask people to go, oh, when people go, oh, you're not like a normal Vic. I go, how many Vickers do you know? And they go, well, just you. And I go, well, there you go then. <laughs> Actually, all my friends are like this. All the clergy I know are a lot of fun um, and are normal people. Every single one of them. Are, a, few are, a few are less extrovert than others. A few are, you know, we, we cover a whole spectrum of people but surely we should you know if we're going to serve the people we should reflect the people right so um i don't know who these grumpy miserable vicars are but i suspect that it's probably the dad's army vicar that people are thinking of from 40 years ago that you know actually we're just not like that we you know they, we weren't like that then we're not we're not like that now um it's just we've got this kind of propriety view you know people are like oh it's like a bit like when the queen gets a marmalade sandwich out of the handbag people go oh yeah she's a normal person as well as the queen you know i'm not comparing myself to the queen obviously that would be ridiculous um but uh i did i think it would lead to that i thought the local press would pick it up i was thrilled when bbc breakfast got a hold of it no of course i didn't think it would lead to uh, a full-time career in the media but when i got ordained i knew that my path would not be the same as anybody else's because how could it be 
you know, just as every single person is different. Do the great theologian and philosopher Dolly Parton once said, uh, find out who you are and do it on purpose. And I kind of think that everybody's ministry, everybody's calling, whether that's priestly or otherwise, needs to be U-shaped. So yours needs to be Matthew-shaped, mine needs to be Kate-shaped. So when people go, oh, I bet you never thought this would happen. Well, no, obviously I didn't know the details, but I didn't think it had... Uh, God had always got something planned for me that was going to be a bit weird and, and fit me. Now, I mean, I've had the pleasure of interviewing, you know, a few celebrities over the years that have, have yeah. done the celebrity goggle box. Um, but obviously, you know, the, you know, doing the, the, the kind of the, the original, as it were. What was the process like? Because, I mean, I, I imagine that, the, you know, there's lots of snacks. Um, it, I mean, is it how, you know, watching telly all day, it sounds fun, but does it get boring? Well, it's seven years ago since we did it, so it's a long time ago. But when we did, so it might have changed. But when we did it, we used to start. The camera crew would arrive about one o'clock in the afternoon. They had a key to the to the house. They'd move furniture around and set up microphones and cameras and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then they would run the cable in through the house to our study in the other side of the house. Um, and that's where they'd set up their gallery with mixing desks and recording things and gadgets that go ping. Um, and uh, we would sit down in our chairs at about four o'clock and they'd go, it's a Thursday and you're watching The X Factor or whatever it was. It wasn't a Thursday. It was a Monday afternoon. But they'd, you'd have to pretend. And um, they'd play you a clip of that particular show and there would be a speaker at the side of you that every now and again would chip in and go, could you just say something about Simon Cowell's hair, please? And so they wouldn't tell you what to say, but if all the other families had very obviously gone, oh, look at the state of Simon Cowell's hair, and then you don't say anything about Simon Cowell's hair, they can't then use you in that in that package, because they that's what everybody's talking about. Um, so it, it was it was hard work. We would start filming at four o'clock. We wouldn't finish till midnight. My kids spent two and a half years eating their tea in their bedrooms and not being able to have friends around. Um, and we did it twice a week. And sometimes, you know, we would be filming on a Saturday night and I would have to be up for church in the morning and all that sort of stuff, you know. When they, And the neighbours were very tolerant because there were about eight cars parked outside um, who were there till late at night putting their car engines on and the lights and stuff. And we lived in a very quiet cul-de-sac in the middle of rural Nottinghamshire. So, yes, it was hard work. Um, we used to get paid um, not a lot, a uh, couple hundred quid a week. Um, I, we don't eat takeaways. My husband doesn't eat takeaways. He doesn't like them. So uh, I love takeaways, but he doesn't. So we don't eat takeaways um, very often, unless I'm having a proper bit at him. Um, and then, so we cooked for the crew. So two nights a week, we would cook for the crew. Um, so there would be eight extra people at our dining room table. And we would sit down and have big pots of chilli or big pots of curry. So most of the budget, most of the wages went on food for the crew. <laughs> I was going to say, the crew must have loved coming around to your house for, for oh, food. Oh, they loved coming to our house. We had, we never changed. The crew never changed for us. They kept coming because um, everywhere else they were surviving on Ginster's pasties, I think, um, and Chinese food. And uh, we were like, nah, that's not for us. So for a while, they must have felt a bit like an extended family again. Oh, they were family. They were absolutely family. We celebrated birthdays, engagements, and that was the best part of it. The best part of doing Gogglebox for us was the crew, was having these beautiful humans in our house that we would never have met otherwise that had come from exotic places like that London and they wanted to tell us about the big city um, and we loved that, we thought that was great, you know, and I enjoyed being part of their lives for a while and them being part of our lives. I mean, the other thing that would have come from Gogglebox is, of course, you know, fame, which I, to, to a certain extent, I imagine you'd have had that beforehand in your local area, but suddenly the whole country knows who you are. Was that a weird thing to get used to? Incredibly weird. It's still weird. It's still really weird. And when people bump into you in the street, if they recognise you, they go, oh, oh, this is really, I feel really weird. And I go, it's weirder for me. I promise you, it's weirder for me. Um, so... It, I remember the first morning after the first episode of Gogglebox went out on the Friday night, we weren't allowed to tell anybody we were on it in case we didn't make the edit because you don't want to make a big deal of you being on it and then you and then they decide to cut you, which they do all the time. Families film Gogglebox all the time and never make it onto the screen. Um, so uh, if I remember the first morning walking out and somebody shouted at me in a park. I went, Gogglebox! At the time, top of their voice. That's happened almost every day for seven years now. Um it's weird 
the weirdest ones it's lovely when people come and say hello i don't mind i'm literally my i'm paid to chat to people that's my job it's lovely when people come over and go oh hello um you don't know me and they don't introduce themselves they just start talking to you so i just make a point of shaking someone's hand and going i'm kate and they go oh i know who you are you go, and you are you know like let's be normal humans in this moment the weirdest things are when people film you or take pictures without asking that is really weird so you sat eating your tea or you sat on a train and you suddenly see this camera sort of pop up like this and start and you think i know what you're doing you're not being subtle um, and then I'll go, sometimes I'll go over if I'm feeling a bit brass, I'll go over and I'll go, hello, are you filming me? And they'll go, ah, ooh, and I'll go, and they go, oh, I didn't want to disturb you, I didn't want to disturb you, you're disturbing me anyway, it'd be really lovely to, should we have a chat? And I'll just sit down and have a chat, and that's really nice, I really like chatting. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so that's weird, and, um, yeah, it, it's, but I, like you say, I've always been a little bit famous where I lived, the local vicar, you can't, you can't shout at your kids in the co-op anyway without it getting around the village in five minutes. <laughs> I mean, of course, the other thing we have to talk about is Radio 2 and what a great job you do on Good Morning Sunday oh, with, um, with Jason. Um, when you started that, that, that show, I mean, how did that come about? And I mean, the, the chemistry between yourself and Jason really works and it really connects with people. So, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> how did that all come about? Um, I got asked, like all these things, you know, you, you, one thing one thing snowballs into another, but you've got no idea if it's going to work. So what happened, um, I started getting asked off the back of Gogglebox, people like, oh, this is really interesting. She's got a dog collar and she seems to be able to string a sentence together and she seems to not be male, pale or stale. She's, you know, so let's let's get her doing something. So I started doing a bit of uh, uh, Tom's Praise. I started doing, you know, I was doing Pause for Thought around that time. And um, I just started saying yes to everything I could say yes to, really. And, and giving it a go. Now, unfortunately, what happened with that was I was in danger of neglecting my congregations because at this point I'm still trying to run three churches. I'm still trying to be a chaplain at a local college three days of the week. Um, I was the I was a chaplain at a FE college, so plumbers, plasterers, hairdressers, handing out condoms, taking them to the clinic, that sort of thing. You know, I had a lot of, is it burning or is it itching conversations? Um, so oh, I'm trying to hold all that down and do this media stuff. And it came to the point where it was really quite clear that it was time to, uh, stop doing full-time parish ministry so I became like a supply vicar like a locum um, but I had no contracts and I'm still freelance now so year on year I have no idea if tomorrow I'm going to get paid <laughs> so you know it is a it's a scary place to be um, Radio 2 phoned me up and said would you like to do Radio 2 and I said yeah of course I would um, and I had to get an agent and I had to start exploring that way, figuring out things like tax and, you know, all that sort of stuff that I had no idea about. Um, and we'll just see, you know, I think the really important thing, I mean, you asked a question about fame earlier. It's a silly, it's a silly word and a, a bizarre concept. Um, but it's something that needs to be, hand I want to handle it really lightly. I'm really happy. I, I love what I do. I love chatting to people. I love being recognisable. I am an attention-seeking maniac and an egotistical nightmare. Um, and I love what I do. Um, but I hope I hold it really lightly. And I know one day it will be finished. It will be over. And somebody will come up to me in the street and go, didn't you used to be a bit famous? And that will be, you know, like like the Copacabana song with Barry Manilow where Lola sat at the end of the bar with faded feathers in her hair. Um I just hope that when it's passed, the next thing that comes along, I will love just as much and be just as happy doing. Um, because that's the way to hold it, isn't it? Otherwise, it, it gets a bit desperate. Otherwise, you're the 65-year-old the actor in stonewashed denim pretending that you, you used to be somebody. Well, you still are somebody. You still love. Um, and my identity is not found in my fame. Um, I'm still Kate, whether I'm on the telly box or not. And I mean, I was going to ask, do you get to enjoy a day off or do you, do you, do you love working too much that a day off, you know, there's no time for that? <laughs> well, I have the most fun ever. I mean, you know, sometimes people go, oh, you work so hard. And I'm like, I really don't. I just show off with a microphone on. I mean, it's long days. So and when you're at work, you're at work. So I filmed this week in Carlisle, which involved a five hour train journey. And I was, I was, I had a microphone pinned on me at 7 a.m. And that microphone didn't come off till 7 p.m. And I was at it all the time. I was, you know, because you, you're, you're the person that's driving it. 
um, every interview, that was Sun's Press, every interview you do, every person you encounter, you have to remember they're only encountering you once and you need to, you know, you do, we call it the Kate Botley show, da da, you know, you sort of, you're on, the curtains are open and you're on. Um, I love it, but I, I make sure I have good holidays, I do get time off, um, I don't have a regular day off, but I try and take little pods here and there. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I have a dad who um, used to be a steel worker. My mum was a school cleaner. And whenever I sit in their house with them and I look at my dad's rough, calloused hands and he's still got the grit under his skin from his working life. And I look at my mum and his knees are absolutely shot and uh, because she spent all her life scrubbing floors. I think, yeah, I'm, we're, we're all right. It's a different sort of hard work, but I ain't got mucky fingernails. Now, I just wanted to, of course, ask about, you know, our amazing NHS. They do such a fantastic job, and particularly over the last couple of years with everything that's been going on. What, what's your impression been of the amazing work they do? You know, what are your thoughts on the amazing NHS? Well, I can, I can tell you a story about um, my mum. So my mum had a huge heart attack. Uh, she happened to be in a doctor's car park where she had the heart attack, which was a bit weird. And then, so they bundled her into the ambulance and uh, took her off to hospital. And due to complications from blood clots and all sorts of things, uh, she ended up having to have a whole load of bowel removed. Um, and she was on, in, she was in intensive care. And I remember gathering at the bedside. At the time, I wasn't a priest, so I got my priest in. And we anointed her and we prayed over her. We did all that while these people in ICU would do it trying to save her body we were trying you know we were doing the soul bit and they were doing the body bit and then she had this long stay um in intensive care and we went every day all day like you do um to, to keep vigil really um and they one nurse i i remember very vividly asked me if i would bring in my mum's perfume so that they could spray her with her own perfume so that she smelt right as we were getting ready to say goodbye to her so that she didn't smell of hospitals so that she smelt like her um because my mum's a woman who likes to look after herself she likes her nails done and her makeup done and that was only one of a catalog of things that that they did to to show that the person in the bed is more than just a body they're trying to keep alive they that they remembered that she was a mum and a wife um an aunt and a sister and all those things um, and I used to get very upset that they'd put that they used to put her in the hospital gown and it said NHS property on it um, now I know they mean the gown but I used to I, I remember one day completely losing my shizzle at the spare bedside going she's not NHS property she's my mum uh, she was never put in one of those gowns ever again um, because that was just the catalyst that upset me that day. Um, and little things, you know, things like that, the perfume, the, the robe. The other thing that they did was, even though she was fully ventilated, um, every time I walked onto the ward, they went, oh, look, Margaret, you're Katie's here. Oh, look, Margaret, you, you're June's here. Oh, look, Margaret, you're Arthur's here. You know, and they would use our names and they would talk to her and tell her what they were doing. Um, and it, it was it was so precious and beautiful to see that and they i know they had a piece of paper with all our names written on so that they could take when we walked because she was there that long that when we walked in they could talk to us um and they listened and they asked questions and of course you know it's not a perfect thing the nhs it's like because nothing is uh, but it it's those things those extras that um make all the difference to somebody who is in who's having the worst day of their lives and I mean, what messages would you love to give to the, the amazing NHS staff, but also the patients who are currently in hospital at the moment as well? Well, it, it's about compassion, isn't it? It's about us all remembering that we're all human, uh, not just the person in the bed, but also the person beside the bed that's taking your temperature and doing your stats. It's really important to remember that they've got a family at home, probably. They're going home to somebody that loves them um, and that we are all connected. Um, and that when we see the best of each other, it's when we see the human behind a uniform, behind, um, you know, the the hospital property gown. Um, and so it, it's about thanking them because, you know, they all every single time I've been in hospital, even in a professional capacity, as somebody visiting someone or as um, a patient myself or as a daughter of a patient, um, it's those wonderful moments of humanity that, 
are the added extra of the NHS that go beyond funding, go beyond all those things. Um, you know, and it is such a precious thing. And it's a bit like all those organisations, you know, we will miss it if it ever goes. We'll go, How, why did we let that go? Why did we fight harder for that? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think it, it's one of our greatest, it's the jewel in our crown, isn't it? No, put it better myself. Um, now, I just want to say it's been an absolute pleasure, Kate. Thank you so much for giving up your time to talk to me. Of course, keep safe. You're welcome back anytime. If you find yourself in the Reading area, by all means, pop in. But yeah, thank, thank you so much you. for giving up your time. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew.